Hello and welcome to this Google Hangout from Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. My name is Heather Thorstensen and I'm the Manager of Communications for Sigma Xi. Today I'm going to be speaking with Christina Guin Paul. She's the 2016 recipient of Sigma Xi's Evan Ferguson Award. This is the award that Sigma Xi gives out to recognize outstanding service to Sigma Xi and its mission. The recipient's name is engraved on a plaque that hangs in Sigma Xi's headquarters in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And the person also receives a lifetime subscription to the society's magazine, American Scientist. Christina has held many leadership roles in the society, including president of the District of Columbia chapter, a spot on the board of directors as the director of the Mid-Atlantic region, and she's chair of the society's committee on qualifications and membership. So congratulations, Christina, and thank you for joining me on the Hangout. Not a problem, Heather. Nice to see you, even though it's just virtually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So your area of expertise is horticulture, and it's an area of study that your parents were also involved in. How do you think your childhood helped shape you as the scientist that you are today? I think first thing, as a child of scientists, my dad is a retired professor from Maryland, my mother's a landscape architect, um, that when your home life doesn't, your time off from school is usually spent working for them or with them, so you have it's a day off of school isn't run and play with the neighbor's kids. It was dad needs somebody to take data or dad needs somebody to measure seedlings. So I spent a lot of time working with him taking data. I paid for my first car by transcribing um, temperature strips from a little digital, not even a digital thermo printer onto database forms for my dad at 50 cents a page. Um, took a while to pay off a car that way, but I did it. But I think it's influenced influenced me a lot to become a scientist because table discussions were never topical and about the news. They were more about my dad's research or what my mom was up to in planning a landscape or something like that. So they were very um, educational discussions around the table versus, you know, what happened in the news today. But I think that shaped um, who I wanted to become and working with my dad a lot. Um, the kind of job that I enjoyed doing was just similar to what he was doing. Okay, great. And today, that led you to the Citrus Quarantine Unit with the United States Department of Agriculture in Beltsville, Maryland, as a support scientist. What type of work do you do there? I manage a greenhouse and a laboratory. Our main focus of data is to um, keep the positive controls for uh, pathogens of citrus that are worldwide problems and to develop tests that detect them more efficiently and effectively than are currently available for detection purposes. So I basically have 4,000 really sick citrus plants that I have to try to keep alive, and I do DNA extractions, ELISAs, et cetera, on them as needed. And we also have a lot of cooperative work by scientists who will work with citrus pathogens from around the globe. So I get to deal with people from France and from Spain and from Brazil and from all the citrus states in the United States as well. Um, so it's a very um, dynamic position because I'm interacting with them regularly to process data, ask questions, help to modify and tweak experiments that get published later on. But it's very, it's very nice. I've been there 25 years um, and I started at USDA as a student when I was in college. So I was also there in the citrus lab doing tissue culture and orchard management of citrus, uh, of um, tissue culture generated apple trees. So I've been there actually since 1986. So this will be my 30th year there. On the wow, property. congratulations. And you first became involved with Sigma Xi as a member in 1999. How did you become involved with Sigma Xi? Um, my supervisor is actually a Sigma Xi member and he nominated me for membership and I knew the people in the DC chapter, a lot of them worked at, at USDA already. So I was interacting with them on a daily basis. Um, unbeknownst to me, and I always joke about this at the annual meeting, I was nominated as an associate level member and made vice president of the DC chapter in the same sentence. So I didn't know that was coming, but I accepted it. Um, I enjoy interacting with the group um, of members because we're very diverse. It's an area chapter, so we're not just based at USDA. We're, we 
encompass the entire DC Beltway, so I get to interact with um, people I don't work with on a daily basis, and people from very different fields of research, very different fields of research. Um, yeah, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about the chapter. So, like you said, you became chapter vice president soon after you joined Sigma Xi, and then you became president soon after that. So you've been president for the last 13 years. I think so, almost 14. Yeah, I almost, lost track. Yeah, you're on your 14th year. And so you mentioned that it's an area chapter. So what types of um, jobs do the people have that are in your chapter, and about how many active people do you have in the chapter? We started, when my um, tenure started as president, we had about 800 members of the DC chapter, and that significantly dropped past 50% of that at the, as this moment. Um, unfortunately, many members don't um, retire and stop being members. A lot of our membership has actually passed on, um, and we haven't been able, an area chapter, it's very difficult to attract new members and nominate new members because we don't have any universities or colleges associated with the area chapter. So we don't, can't just give students memberships as they graduate um, and find students who aren't, who don't already come into USDA or NIH or any of the other places that have members that aren't already members of another chapter. Um, the DC, uh, DC area, I think, has about 14 active chapters around the Beltway. So we, our membership is very diverse, and a lot of members um, come to my events that aren't members of my chapter because I've put out an area-wide um, list, a community that involves everybody, no matter what chapter you're in, to come to our events, meetings, hikes, tours, etc. Um, and we've attracted our, when we've stayed active, we've attracted a number of new members over the years, but not at the rate that, um, unfortunately, they're not with us anymore. Um, but it's just difficult because we aren't a university um, established chapter. Um, so there are hurdles, but the events have to be broad and they have to be all over the place. We can't do brown bag lunches. We can't do, you know, auditorium seminars because we're, there's what, 45 miles of the DC Beltway around um, the capital of DC. So it's hard to get members of just of our chapter together. It's easier just to put out an all and all points bulletin to all members and say, hey, we're having this event. Why don't you come if we're having one near you? Because we try to rotate around the area when we had previous events. So what sort of activities does your chapter do? Um, for the past eight years, we've done a monthly cafe. Um, so we're on year eight. So that's eight times 12. Um, we've done... 96, almost 100 cafes. We used to have um, a lot of banquets and dinner type lectures, but I found that um, the cost of putting those together became um, too steep with the price of catering in the DC area. Um, people weren't willing to pay the 50 or $60 to come to an event for a you know, dinner with a really cool science lecture, um, and traffic in this area around dinner time any night of the week is pretty impossible. So we've tried um, doing other events like on Sundays or weekdays that are luncheons and more daylight based. Um, so we've done different events over the years. The cafes really work for us because there's no RSVP list for me to keep track of. There's no cost involved to the chapter at all. Um, we've done a couple of regional meetings with um, various local chapters, George Mason, Tidewater, and University of Maryland over the years. Again, it's hard to get people in this area are so multitasked already that it's difficult to um, schedule things like that because it's in between sporting events at different colleges. It's different. It's all the D.C. teams and Baltimore teams. and There's so many conflicting events in this area to work around. But we're trying to find another niche other than cafes haven't quite found one yet other than the banquets, the normal things. Um, the hikes are really do good for us because we can uh, get a younger crowd that likes outdoors and more mobile to talk with a geologist or a botanist or a breeder from the Arboretum. Um, so we've been quite successful with those when I've had the opportunity to organize them. Okay. And explain what a science cafe is in case people don't know, and then also the partners that you're using to put them on. Um, but we just find people who are interested in talking about their work. 
and we market it as you get to talk to a scientist without any bureaucracy, without a politician, without anything in between. So some things aren't what you learned on the internet. They aren't what you heard about on the radio because there's been too many um, journalistic uh, editings <laughs> that have gone on in translation of the science out to the public. Um, so we, we've generally found just word of mouth, hey, if you've heard somebody who's really, you'd really want to hear again, give us a holler, give us a name, and then my partner and I make the contacts and get the information and get them booked. We're already booking into 2017 at this point. Um, cooperatively working with the Rockville Science Center. It was a program started about nine years ago. They actually wanted to build a brick and mortar science center in Rockville, which is a technological corridor um, for the DC area, a very um, high tech biological companies. There's just a bunch of headquarter buildings, et cetera, and that. And we started the cafes as a way to um, gain momentum towards a brick and mortar, but thus far brick and mortar hasn't happened and the cafe movement is pretty much like set in stone. Everybody comes. It's always the third Tuesday of the month. Um, my George, my coordinator help is um, a woman, Ruth Hanessian, who owns, of all things, she owns a bird store, a pet store, um, but she has a, green, a degree in ornithology and she's very hooked into invasive species and birds and because she lives in Rockville and works, owns the store, she meets a lot of interesting people. So she and I together, about 50-50, get the speakers um, lined up and everything. So we make contacts, hey, what, what months are you available, can you be there, and then maintain contact until the actual lecture. Um, the one we have next week is, she is a guy who owns a bird and came into her store and he happens to do all the ear research at Georgetown University. So oh, nice. he'll be giving a lecture on hearing. So it's just chance encounters like that and then through my connections with the Maryland greenhouse industry, et cetera, as well, and University of Maryland, we just, we've never run out of speakers. And people are always hearing somebody, and I'll get a name and name and an email contact in the mail and say, oh, yeah, I heard this person. They're awesome. See if you can get them. So one of the speakers I just lined up is, his name is Call Sign Bio. He was a, um, he wrote a book, and it's like the making of Top Gun. It's going to be flight safety and high-speed flight, and he was a fighter pilot. Um, so that's one of the ones I've just been in contact with, and he's, now booked for November or September, I think. But it's just various contacts like that that I get. Okay. So what are some of the other topics that you've had at your science cafe, and where is your science cafe held? The cafe, um, the, the location that's worked the best for us ha is a cafeteria-style restaurant. It's a barbecue joint with a chow line. So there's no waiters and waitresses running around um, between the tables during, during the lecture. Um, on a Tuesday night, they're, they're willing to give us a space for free, um, so we're not paying anything out, and they actually have to triple their staff to take care of us. So that's, we bring between probably 50 to 110 on a monthly basis into their restaurant on a Tuesday night when there's nothing else to do. Um, other topic, we've had everything. We've had Polynesian engineering, celestial navigation, um, composting, bee research, um, automobile safety, I mean, you just name it, even teaching science. We have a, one, two of our members teach um, personality traits and how to teach people based on how they learn. And I got a lot of flack, like, why are you doing this? This isn't science. It's like, yeah, it's how your brain works and how you understand what you're being taught and people understand in different ways. Women tend to be more um, into images, whereas men like directions. Um, but it's also, it's also a combination of how you speak and your tones and everything else. So it is a science. Um, but yeah, we've, we've just done the gambit. We've done just about anything you can name. Structures, how an elevator works, um, anything. Birds, bees, composting in your backyard, invasive species. We've had after, over 96. I mean, there's just been everything. NASA, several NASA lectures on anti-gravity life and life in space, and uh, the, the uh, guy who gave the lecture ended up giving us a tour of the Udvarhazy Center as one of our out-of-the-box, what I call the out-of-the-box, like Sigma's Eye, which isn't in a restaurant, <laughs> isn't with a podium, isn't with a microphone, um, and that was a two-hour uh, tour turned into eight.
because there were so many questions. Wow. So people really liked it. So over the years, what have you learned about what it takes to successfully run a Sigma Xi chapter that might help less experienced chapter officers? I think communication is the biggest part. Um, it's staying in touch with your member base a lot and not um, to the point of annoyance though. We've, we've had a, a Rockville Science Center person, um, former employee or former volunteer sending out too many emails and that was became obnoxious. So it's learning the timing of your people and listening to what they want. Um, the communication through emails, on a personal basis, like I set up my SigmaZyDC at gmail.com account to handle all my SigmaZy mail um, because that way it's separate from everything else so I can keep it separate and keep in tune with what's happening with my chapter. Um, and also involving, I found a lot of people, and this is another portion of CQM we're trying to work with, um, with this new communities we have on, online, which is I think a really great idea and really working well. Um, we can affiliate members, every member is affiliated with the chapter or an at-large member. But in a lot of cases, we found out that they don't know that there's another active chapter around because they're not in touch with them. And so through the communities, we can most likely link people with two chapters, one that they want to be a member of that may not be an active chapter, may not be doing much, and one, an area chapter or another chapter that's really doing a lot of things so they can hear about, and that's how I've got, gained a lot of members to the DC chapter from inactive members and from members who are in inactive chapters. They don't even know their chapter's inactive. Um, they're still a member of it, but it's not an active chapter, and I'm like, hey, you can join us and, and be on our listserv and get to know everybody, and we have events, and we're still doing a lot of things. The other thing is diverse. Um, because we're interdisciplinary, that just opens the door to doing lectures and things on everything. Um, you know, you get, everybody's going to get a little bit of um, bounce back from, oh, well, I'm not coming because it's not a chemistry lecture and I'm a chemist. It's like, well, that's not the point of Sigma Xi. The point of Sigma Xi is you're a chemist, but you're also probably a little bit of an engineer. You probably got a little, you know, other specialties in your, in your field of study. I mean, as a plant pathologist, I'm a horticulturist, plant physiologist, entomologist, microbiologist, virologist. And it goes on, so my profession is interdisciplinary. Even though I'm a plant pathologist, um, it's composed of a bunch of things. And that's what I think is the importance and why I'm still Sigma Xi, because it allows me to interact with all these other people who play a small role in what I do. But you never know where a good idea is going to come from. When you talk to somebody in science, it'll just, a light bulb goes off. You're like, oh, I could do that, and that would work because I didn't know about that because I'm actually not an entomologist. I do entomology, but that's not my primary field of study, and I didn't know about that little bit of information. Um, so it really um, just helps. I mean, the communication is just key to a successful chapter. Okay. And so you're also the chair of the Sigma Xi Committee on Qualifications mm -hmm. and Membership, and that's the committee that oversees the health of chapters and the membership at large, which is the group of members who aren't affiliated with a specific chapter. So I was wondering, what are some of the challenges that you see facing Sigma Xi's membership today? Um, the, the whole trend is we are an aging society, unfortunately. We have a high bump of young members and we have a meet, low middle and high when you, people have more time after they retire, after their kids are in college, et cetera. Um, and that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, people will see this, and I'll, and I'll bring this up, we're gonna have a couple of motions before chapters to vote on soon. That should be going out shortly. Um, in order to get more members, you have to start younger. So there's a, there's a motion that we induct, we have, Explorer clubs for kids, for it led by a Sigma Xi member or a chapter nearby that would mentor a group of youngsters in a club, a science club at their school. And this could be also virtual too, given some kids' schools are not near a chapter or may not have a member to run them. Um, we're also initiating, um, uh, what else, what are the other motions? The clubs. And if you want to form a chapter, 
we now can allow, we will put forth to allow associate members to form a chapter. Um, associate members are usually younger because they don't have the experience yet to become a full member in publications, et cetera. But they may have more time because they're not a PI on an, on an experiment to have more time to, do, to give and volunteer to help a chapter. Um, so that's an important change. The website being updated has been fabulous help because of the communities and the blogging, et cetera. Um, so I think that's also very important and also getting an eventual goal financially would be to get the AMSI in a mobile app um, so we can get that out on Kindles and phones easier than it is right now. Um, I don't, that's probably in the future at some point. Um, just retaining members, and I think part of that is that communication key, making it as easy as possible for chapter officers to communicate with each other and also their chapter members. Um, we have members who, and even directors, who don't overly communicate, um, and we need to help them. And I'm, I'm sure that Iman, our new director of chapters, is really on the ball with that, and she's um, being very energized behind and helping members who need that help to set up that communication process because it's not an easy learning curve for some, um, but it is, is kind of a learning curve. So some of us of, of uh, median and younger generations get it and others don't, um, but I think it's an important part and it'll help the society as a whole um, to keep and retain members because of the communication. It's always that why Sigma Xi, why Sigma Xi for you, why Sigma Xi for me. Um, my, por my part is not, I'm not so much needing the pat on the back and the honor part of it, but the ethics and the outreach part of science to the public um, is what holds me in. It's communicating that science and to communicate, you have to communicate, so. Yep. Okay, and you're also director of Sigma Xi's Mid-Atlantic region, and that gives you a spot on the board of directors. What would you like the membership to know about what it's like to be on the board and what the board's working on? The board is very multifaceted because we're composed of both the regional directors and the constituency directors. Um, so we have a little bit of everybody. Um, I think that members think the board is just there to run the society, but they don't understand that they need to talk to us to tell us what they want the society to do and what directions they want the society to run in. Um, I represent them, and I'm all, I'm, for my membership, I send out, you know, a mid-Atlantic email to all members in the mid-Atlantic area saying, hey, what would you like me to work on for the society? Do you have ideas and directions of what you think the society should be doing or something we shouldn't be doing? Um, and I do this, you know, the survey monkey surveys, things like that to get an idea of what they want me to do rather than what I want me to do um, because I'm not there to represent me and my goals. I'm rep there to represent them and their goals. Um, and then being an area chapter myself gives it, brings in an, another facet because area chapters function way differently than institutional chapters and college-based chapters. Um, so things that work for um, the university's baccalaureate's research and development don't work for area chapters so much. Um, and the at-large is a whole other ball of wax because they're not affiliated with the chapter. And it's like, okay, why are you in Sigma Xi as just an individual and not, not with a chapter? And trying to figure out that key may help us um, gain more members if we can figure that out. Because we are one of the few societies that is still chapter-based, but the chapter-based I think enriches us, um, many members who are in chapters, um, I think are there because of that, because there's some camaraderie with the chapter. I mean, I, I, I still have the original charter, um, I think it's in the lobby there, in our, or in our papers that the, the original DC chapter was actually based at the Smithsonian Institution and there's a letter there that states that they would rather have meetings not during their work day to, so they're not taken away from their, their research. So they wanted meetings like in the evenings or on weekends and stuff like that so they wouldn't, it wouldn't affect their research so much but they were all, they were very invigorated by talking to one another from the different fields of science. Um, but I think that interdisciplinary aspect 
it's brought a lot in the board and we have to, the board at, members have to keep an open mind that what works for them may not work for everybody, but we need to be very flexible. Um, and the board, we try to, we try to do that within the extent of our bylaws and constitution. And like myself, if I don't like the laws, I change them, which is why I became a director. So we can change the bylaws to be more um, modern. We were founded in, you know, we just had our 125th year anniversary and some of the things that were written in bylaws and constitution were written in 125 years ago for that society that level of the society whereas some things are still applicable and other things aren't and being on the board allows me to say and how to how we can change and improve that to get with this generation because this generation is who we need as members and so working with the, through the CQM board we're trying to get that flexibility in there. Okay. And is there anything else that you wanted to mention about what the board's working on besides the items coming up to vote that you already mentioned? Well, we just had our board meeting. So basically the cycle of the, the meeting was to approve those motions to be put forth to the chapters. Um, the other is we were, we were still hunting for a CEO. So there was that, that entire discussion, but, um, John Nemeth has decided to stick on for a while longer, so that's awesome because he's been a great help um, and a great push of energy into the board. Um, we're also going to be moving our meetings, so we're not going to be meeting in November. This will be our last meeting in November. We're moving them into a summertime schedule in hopes of gaining members um, to attend that are usually busy in November because they're teaching. Um, so we're hoping that by moving it to university setting, during the summer, staying in dorms so that the, the price tag becomes a little cheaper and um, in the summer when obviously the professors and who teach classes aren't teaching, don't have their teaching schedules um, to prohibit them from coming to the meetings. Because we hear at the annual meetings, well, I'm the only representative to come to chapter and I'm retired because I'm not teaching and everybody else is teaching, that's why I'm here. You know, and I'm sure that a lot of people would like to come to the meetings, but their schedules doesn't allow them to in November when our meetings usually are held. So we're making a push in that direction and going to biannual meetings probably versus annual, though that's still kind of being discussed. Okay. And speaking of the annual meeting, you've been the photographer for Sigma Zai's annual meeting and student research conference. So having that experience of being at that event, what do you see as the value of members getting together for that meeting? The meetings are so energizing, getting to talk to everybody um, and putting names to faces of people you've emailed with um, a lot, dealing with chapter events or whatnot, because um, we have caucus meetings for the regions and the constituencies during the meetings. Um, the other advantage is having all the students there and just seeing their energy for science. Um, it's wonderful seeing how um, motivated the students are, even at the high school level, to present a poster at a national meeting. Um, and if we can keep them in science through that, that's just a bonus. Um, the interaction between members, um, we're, we're all, a bunch of us have been coming to meetings for a long time, so it's a chance to catch up. And also, with this new basis of the meetings being more scientifically based versus just um, governance, so to speak, um, to learn something. The last few have been really, I found really educational for me because I don't get off through my job to go to my annual meetings. We don't have funding, um, but I can go to this because it's on my own time. And they, I found them to be really educational. The, the sessions you gave at the last meeting on communications and Facebook and Twitter, I mean, half the room was like, huh? Oh, that's cool. Let's do that. Um, just that communication of science piece is wonderful and the theme that we've had um, other meetings themed around food and around things that were just parts of the meeting not the majority and I'm hoping that this meeting the science is the majority and also listening to the guest lectures the award-winning lectures um, from young scientists from the McGovern Award etc are just they're fabulous they're just an insight a, a really focused insight into one piece of research um, which I think is just just wonderful um, to, for people to be able to talk about their work that may not have been recognized in other, other forums before. 
and in front of a general audience because they're speaking to across disciplines. So it's focused on their research, but it's un very understandable for those of us who are like, you know, plant scientists. <laughs> <laughs> And you volunteer so much time for Sigma Xi, and you've mentioned that you enjoy Sigma Xi because it's interdisciplinary and it has outreach aspects to it. Is, are there any other reasons why it's so important for you to be a part of the society? For me, it's all about the the outreach of pure science. Um, you go on Facebook and get emails of so much stuff on the internet that's so not true, and it's great to be able to, you know, pick up the phone and call somebody or email somebody who you know through Sigma Xi and go, okay, can you explain this to me because they're not doing this right, but I can't explain it any better. Um, and then to learn another piece of information. Um, I, I always say it's not who you know, it's what you know. And I think scientists as a whole have done a really poor job of communicating their science. Um, they're not real Scientists tend to be introverts, they tend to be quiet, they're not out there. And so when their research gets waylaid by the internet and things, they don't speak out. And I think we need to speak out because there's so much stuff going on that is not science-based, it's based on internet hype. Um, so that's, my, that's why I stay in it. I, because I can communicate with a very huge broad band of people and be able to pick up the phone or, or pop an email to somebody and say, hey, you're, you do this research, can you help me out here? Um, and I think that's one of the networking with other people globally is just been an incredible experience. Great, well thank you and congratulations on your Evan Ferguson Award. I thank you so much and I had the pleasure of meeting Evan at my first couple of national meetings, and he was Mr. Sigma Xi, and he was an amazing person. So being honored in this way is really special. So I thank you all. Thank you.